hello um it's october so i thought i'd take you for a little tour of the garden so you can see what's going on it's very tidy and uh organized which is unusual i wonder if i've forgotten something very important for the first time this year we've really finished our season at the end of september this has been an objective of mine for many years i've always wanted to be a flower farmer who grows has a productive patch for set with product for sale between the 1st of April and the end of September. And we finished at the end of September and <laughs> the annuals are all gone. It's very speedy. Anyway, uh, let's go and have a look. In the spirit of never going anywhere empty handed, of course, we have bulbs to plant, it being October. These are Narcissi. I've got a selection um, from my friends at Peter Nyson. We buy our bulbs from Peter Nyson because they say that they don't dip them in neonicotinoids. And that's for us, that's a really big deal because we're keen on not affecting the bees. The point of this flower farm is partly to make us a living, but also partly to make an environment in which invertebrates flourish. Because if you look after the invertebrates, then the rest of the food chain, us included, will look after itself. So um, it's important to us that we don't have anything dipped in neonicotinoids. So I've got some narcissi and some crocuses here uh, for planting. So we'll take a couple of bags with us. I have a theory with bulb planting that, especially when you're planting kind of ad hoc, if you're planting tulips in chunks, then plant them in chunks, that's fine. Uh, then you do that all at once. But Narcissi, for me, I plant a lot of Narcissi just around under the trees, sort of on the edges of patches uh, in different places, <laughs> so that as the sun rises in the spring and the warmth comes, they don't all flower at once. I like them to flower in sort of succession. Plus, I can see them from my bedroom window, far, far away in the lug form. It's very pretty. So um, I'll take some with me. And this is how I plant my bulbs. If, I'm a no if I were a normal gardener, I would just, every time I went outside, put a little bag of bulbs in my pocket and take with me a spade and just plant them as I go. So that's what we'll do while we're out there. Come on, come with me and I'll show you what we've got. Hmm, after a sort out, turns out I've been a little bit more enthusiastic with my bulb ordering than I remembered. So I may have to be a bit more systematic about planting them. <laughs> it always happens, doesn't it? You order your bulbs in May and you think, oh yes, well I have 250 of these and 250 of those. And they arrive and you have to plant them. And you suddenly think, hmm, I think I have rather a lot here. Anyway, I've got uh, Narcissus Talia, lovely white. Uh, I've got um, Cheerfulness, uh, scented, little scented double, very pretty little clusters of flowers on the top. And um, uh, this one, other one, Fragrant Breeze, a single with a sort of apricot-y cup, very pretty, like that. And I seem to have inadvertently ordered some crocuses. Mm -hmm, never mind. Uh, Jeanne d'Arc. So these are going to go along the front of the house, so they'll make a display that everybody in the village can enjoy as they drive past. Right, um, let's go for a walk around the garden. I'm not going to plant these <laughs> with you because there are too many. I'll show you what else we've got to do. So as we set off around the garden, I uh, just thought I'd show you the back door pots, which have knitted together very nicely. Do you remember I did a clip at the beginning of the summer um, and I said I hoped that everything would knit together nicely um, and it looked all a little bit patchy because the plants were quite small and they were all sort of sulking like children in a new school not sure how they were going to get on with each other and here we are sometime later and they've all done really really nicely so I'm pleased with that uh, especially Come with me and I'll show you. Look, the dark red leaves here are the coleus, which really did brilliantly. And I will never be without coleus at the back door. I'm afraid I buy 
I buy small plants from the garden centre when I see them because it's not something I remember to sow. Uh, I'm a cut flower farmer and coleus a backdoor pot joy. More backdoor pot joy and these would make great cut flowers if I grew more of them. Look at my nareens. They are growing in a big old half metal barrel pretty much filled with gravel and I planted them two years ago with their necks the necks of the bulbs sent standing proud of the top of the gravel and they have sat there they sulked their first year they did nothing they got some leaf action but no flowers but happy days and look how good they are with that red uh, salvia the name of which I'm afraid I is long gone. But aren't they great? Very happy with those. So here's the greenhouse, had a big tidy up, a little wash down, ready for the winter, and it's beginning to fill up with cuttings and seedlings, ready for the spring. The sweet peas there will eventually be planted in this small tunnel where they have been for several years in a row um, and they're fine. I put them, I do give them a whole trench of new compost every time. Um, and they do very nicely in here with the fig and the beech tree. Meanwhile, here is the big tunnel and I have mulched it or rather my son mulched it and we've watered it twice. And look, here come here comes, this is next year's Lavatera, germinating nicely. And all sorts of bits and pieces beginning to come and we will slowly identify them. And then we will rationalize them into blocks. And that is next year's early crop. Uh, and yes, this tunnel does need a wash. <laughs> I agree. We'll leave this Salvia uglinosa and Verbena bonariensis to stand all winter, even when it's just seed heads, because you can imagine the cover this gives for wildlife, small birds, beetles, and uh, through the winter, they will have somewhere to live and lots to eat and then we will cut this all down in the spring, probably as late as April. Now, when I do come to planting my bulbs, hello, I have a very simple system. I have a pocket full of bulbs. I stick a spade in the ground. I flip up a small square. I take the bulbs, just a handful, and I put them in the right way up. Here are five going in. I flip the earth back down over them, stamp it down nicely, and leave them to fatten up over winter. Oh. Pull this up a bit and I'll leave them to fatten up over winter and flower in the spring. For me, quite often, Narcissi don't flower their first year. They take a year to settle in uh, and I plant them sort of in the lee of trees so they, sh don't, so they can get shaded out in the summer. Um, I want to be able to see them. And I scatter them about. So that was a little handful of talia, which will give me pleasure, I hope. If not next spring, <laughs> then the spring afterwards. So here we are in the, pretty much the annuals and biennials patch. And you can see that all those lovely flowers have gone. I'm a flower farmer, not a gardener. And the awful thing is, once I call time on my season, end of September, it's time to clear up because then we're ready for the next thing. And, you know, the skill is, I, I was talking at my career change flower farming workshop yesterday, and I was saying, 
you can't be romantic, well you can be romantic about your garden if you want, but the skill is to achieve the objectives when you're flower farming so that you can then achieve the next objective. And I don't know about you, but I'd like to slow down a little bit, have less of a stressful winter and uh, try and get some other stuff on the ground. And so I'm afraid the cosmos, I'll show you, is on the compost heap. Can you see, there's the huge compost heap in the corner. Uh, <laughs> in full flower, we ripped it up. It's kind of, it is, you have a, you kind of get used to it. You say, no, we'll keep it. No, we'll rip it up. Get it done, get it done. And then we can all spend the winter less, you know, get ahead in my life. If I can get ahead. In the spirit of never going upstairs empty handed, if you see some stuff, time to get everything out. I have got plenty for the bees, believe me. I'm not taking anything away from the bees. The, um, <laughs> the wind is blowing you off the thing, but also the bees have got a whole wall of honey, uh, to t I mean, of pollen to take off the ivy. Vast amounts of stuff in flower here, so don't, please don't worry that the bees will go without, they won't. Anyway, um, so as you can see, as we clear, we mulch, and we're planting, all the biennials are being put, have, are now in, and um, and my next thing is to make room for the tulips. I've got 6,000 tulips. We get about 200 into a square meter. So I need 30 running meters of meter wide bed and uh, pretty much done, ready to go. And they will go in in November. So that's October. It's tidy though, isn't it? I like it when it looks this tidy, tidy. And we've had just enough rain that I haven't had to water in the biennials, which makes me very happy. As usual, my camera is falling forward, so I'm having to kneel, kneel down. Honestly, hopeless. It really is attractively tidy for the time of year. Right, my next job is to choose which of my dahlias I'm going to keep and overwinter. Which ones am I going to dig up and save the tubers for overwinter? So I'm going to go round now and I've got pigtail spikes. Anyone who come on my workshops knows that I'm endlessly talking. <laughs> this is the best multi-purpose tool in my garden. And I'm going to spike the best dahlias, uh, one, maximum two of each variety, so that I will have a maximum of about 40 different uh, tubers to store over winter. I don't want to store all of them. So I'm looking for good sized plants, really healthy leaves, good sized flowers, any kind of, uh, I haven't got any um, crown gall. I don't think I've got any virus, but anything where there's a leaf that looks a bit yellow or just not flourishing in any way, those I'm not saving. I'm only saving the very best and I will propagate cuttings from those very best tubers at the end of March, beginning of April next year. Uh, right, here we go. I should also label. I don't have time to do that today, but I have got time to choose which ones I'm going to keep. And while I'm at it, because I need the pigtail spikes that is supporting the watering system, I'm going to take the watering system off and you'll see what it is. It's very simple. I have ordinary hose pipe. I have made holes in it from time to time and wrapped those holes in bits of uh, milk bottle and tied them on tightly so that when I turn the water on, it squirts out sideways. And each length of bed has its own, it doesn't have its own, I have a length of hose pipe, which I can move from bed to bed and plug in when it's needed. So this is how it works. It's really simple. This is a classic uh, Fabrizio Bocca Acme watering system. We're watering above the ground. It's completely legal. Uh, we're not going to offend the water company and it's movable. 
So I'm going to roll this up and put it away. <laughs> so here is the watering length, the right length for this bed. And it's now going to be put in the shed for the winter. And it was held up along the centre of the bed by pigtail spikes, which I can now use to tell me when the time comes which dahlias I'm saving. Multitasking. By the way, <laughs> please do subscribe to the channel. Press the bell icon and I'll tell you when I've got new clips coming out. And if any of the tips and tricks I give you along the way are useful, or you just would like to support the channel and making more clips, then please do buy me a coffee. The link to coffee buying is in the blurb to all my clips. Right, better get on. Right, it's the next day. And um, as you can hear, it's much calmer, a little cooler, but nice and sunny. Whew. Yesterday's weather was horrible. I did manage to plant 250 Talia Narcissi in the persistent drizzle before giving up and going and having my annual conversation with the accountant, which as a person running a lifestyle business is one of the most important meetings of my year. Anyway, I'm gonna finish off my little tour. I'm quite excited today. I'm feeling all because uh, I did a workshop last evening, an online uh, lifestyle business workshop. I do lots of different workshops. Uh, both here at the farm and online. And I really am very interested in what makes small businesses, really micro businesses, successful at, on, on the terms of the business owner. And so I spend a lot of time helping people work out what it is they really want and how they can monetize that effectively so that they can live on doing the thing that they love. Anyway, so I was very excited because after that, uh, we got a few Google reviews and I now have 151, 151 five-star Google reviews for my workshops. So I'm really, really pleased. Thank you very much. For, so for those of you who've been on workshops, I really, really appreciate it because that makes such a difference for a small business like mine. Anyway, let's have a look and see what we've got. Still going in the garden and I've got some bits to cut I'm, I'm actually in a bit of a hurry I'm back off up to mum's tomorrow um, if you've been around over the summer you'll know my mum broke her ankle and it was sort of the catalyst for a change in the way that um, mum and dad live and um, anyway so I'm back off up there tomorrow so hopefully I'll be making a clip of mum's potting shed over the weekend uh, but I'm teaching an online demo tomorrow night from mum and dad's of making an autumn wreath. So I need to cut my bits for my autumn wreath. And while my season is officially over, I always end up doing flowers. Uh, I have a weekly delivery for um, number one Bruton, which is a lovely little hotel in my nearby fashionable town. Uh, and the nearby school wants some dahlias for a do they've got tomorrow night. So I'm cutting while I'm talking to you. Let's go and have a look at the garden and see what there is to cut or not. It's a different look this week. It may be October, but actually there's still quite a lot when you look. And I think what you have to do as a, as a person looking for things to cut from your garden is get up close and personal and look. These grasses, absolutely fantastic. So I will definitely have some of those. Um, there's masses of the red you can see there in the middle is sedum. There's masses of sedum, but in front of the sedum is still flowering away Achillea. So I'm going to have some Achillea. And behind the sedum, going over gently, is the limelight hydrangea, which I have cut and cut and cut some more. Next door to the limelight, limelight hydrangea, bright red, is a, that's a, um, an ornamental spindle, the variety of which I could not tell you. Um, it sheds its berries very quickly, but is a lovely foliage. And more foliage here. This is my gorgeous Cotinus, um, which is having a sort of mini spring moment and trying to flower. Not a bad thing in my book. Might have some of that. It didn't like the dry summer, I have to say. 
It looks as though it could do with a massive mulch this winter and being left alone a bit. Look, it's dry. It's been very dry, but it's not dead, <laughs> despite the weather. Look, if you were going to cut things to make an autumn wreath, I suspect you too would spy the allium seed heads and think I might have a few of those. And look down here for my arrangement for number one Bruton. Look at the still going strong. I mean, this is six plants of Penstemon. It's the most bog standard one. I think it's garnet. And that will stand in water quite happily. And there are roses, not masses, but I don't need masses. I need a few. So I'll have some few roses. The um, end of the echinacea means that I can cut these rather tired looking stems. I'm always doing this. Pull the petals off and you get a really lovely orange sort of thistle if you're looking for something a bit more perfect. Um, what else have we got up here? I will be cutting, still cutting crab apples. The Physocarpus, nine bark. <coughs> Excuse me. Is cuttable. Um, it's beginning to look a bit dry. It is deciduous, so it won't be there forever. Here is um, a really silly elder that I shouldn't have up here, but I'm very fond of it. It's not great for cutting. So do what I do, not what I say. This is... Um, but it's very pretty in life. And it always sheds its leaves before anything else. So I always think, every year I think, oh, is it going to die suddenly? And it doesn't. Uh, more lovely things to cut. Look, this is a white verbena. And the seed pods are absolutely fantastic, both green and rather dramatic rusty colour as they've aged so I think they might be quite good for my my autumn wreath and still colour from that variegated cornus and the physocarpus dark gold behind is my curly whirly willow which of course I'll be using in the winter once the leaves fall off um, it's a lovely structural plant to have in your winter arrangements um so let's cut a bit oh look at the color this is achillea field of gold i think cloth of gold field of gold field of gold um still going possibly not good enough quality for what i'm looking for but you know that's the thing about having perennial beds is the perennials hold the space all year this on the other hand uh, is the one I saw at if you saw my clip last week at RHS Wisley here we have Persicaria Red Baron and that foliage is such great colour so I don't have very much of it but it's just fabulous for this time of year so I'll have some of that and let's get cutting I need nice bendy twigs to make the base for my autumn wreath tomorrow at my demo. You can book a place on my website if you like. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to use this poplar. Poplar's got lovely, very flexible, long stems. But you could use willow, you could use all sorts of things. Um, I just have these poplars here ready and very useful. This rose is Gentle Hermione. And as you can see, she's got a very open face here. If I cut that, it will shed quite quickly. But do you see all these side buds? They will happily go in either the arrangement for the hotel or the wreath. So I'll have those. Now I'm working my way around the edge of our plot where we planted years and years and years ago when we first came here. We planted a band of trees, which have now made a really charming little wood. And the path is mostly moss. 
and for my foraged wreath tomorrow I'm going to gather some moss. Look, it just comes up. You want to look out for a bit where it's sort of squishy looking, cushiony, and it just comes up in your hand. It's a very easy thing to do. And while walking around the hedgerow with your little trolley, it's worth keeping your eyes peeled for treasure. I think that these acorns will be good in my wreath. There are acorns everywhere. It's, is it a masked year? Is that what you call it when there are this many acorns? And it's very important to scrump the apples as I pass. <laughs> Breakfast. Right, there we are. The piece has been made for the hotel. My family, we always call a hotel a hotel. Don't ask me why. Anyway, the piece is made for number one, Bruton. Uh, the dahlias are cut for the school party. Uh, here are the bits that I've got for my wreathing. I'll show you. Yes, I may have slightly overcut, but it's fun to walk around the garden at this time of year and spy interesting bits and pieces that might make lovely ingredients for a wreath. So the wreath is all ready. And I hope you've enjoyed this little tour of the garden in October. It feels definitely the season is changing. I am, you know, at the stage where I'm composing tweets, <laughs> extolling the virtues of the vest. Oh yes, I am a very middle-aged woman. Um, but go and have a look around your garden. You may find there's all sorts of things which might cut and make a lovely arrangement. Or join me tomorrow afternoon on my wreathing workshop and uh, maybe be inspired to go and have a rave up in your garden and make an autumn wreath yourself. If you have enjoyed uh, the clip, please do subscribe to the channel. Press the bell icon and we'll tell you when we've got more clips coming up. And if any of the tips and tricks I give you along the way are helpful, please do buy me a coffee. I'm sorry if this is annoying. There's a lady said, it's very annoying the way you ask for coffee all the time. And I appreciate that. But I also appreciate the coffees. <laughs> so anyway, uh, if you'd like to support the channel in any way, the best way to do it is to buy me a coffee or come along to a workshop. Have a look on my website. And if you're not sure how the workshops might be, whether you'll get anything out of them, then do have a read of some of our 151 five-star reviews for our workshops. Anyway, thanks very much for coming along on this clip. I hope you've enjoyed the October garden and I'll see you very soon.